Thank you so much, Fergus. It is a real delight to be with you all tonight. The passage I chose uh, to base what I'm saying uh, is from Matthew chapter 15, and it begins at verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Amen. Now may I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the great moral issues of the last hundred years has been cultural identity. The world was horrified to hear that the Nazi Germans had killed six million people whose only crime was that they were Jewish. The world was then shocked to watch the apartheid system in South Africa discriminate in many ways against most of the population simply because of the color of their skin. And eventually, through a lot of hard work, much change came. Other parts of the world today still struggle with racial distinctions between people. We can identify with the evil and discrimination because we've had our own shameful past in this island. For many countries, the challenge is now to take the growing belief that all humans are equal, irrespective of race or color, and to make it work within our societies where people of many different backgrounds can live together in peace and in harmony. Yet there's still much prejudice, hatred, and suspicion to overcome. So when we read this story in our own setting, we may find it quite shocking. It looks as if at the beginning, Jesus is refusing to help someone in need just because she's from the wrong race. Let's face it, we wouldn't think much of a doctor who didn't treat all his patients and who would refuse to treat people just because he or she wasn't from the right family background or wasn't the right color. It's not what we expect. So we need to think what's going on. Jesus' mission is being defined here. He wasn't simply a traveling doctor whose task was to heal everyone that he encountered. He had a very specific calling. And it was God's people, God's chosen people, Israel. They needed to know that God was now, at last, fulfilling his promises. The kingdom that they had longed for was beginning to appear, and Jesus was its herald. And the disciples were only just beginning to realize this, that he himself was God's anointed king. 
But the message was always to be aimed at Israel first. Not to do this would be to imply that God had made a mistake in choosing and calling Israel to be his special people, the promise bearers. Now, it's a pity that many Christians have forgotten that and forgotten the specialness of Israel in the purposes of God. If God's new life was to come through the world, it would come through Israel. And that's why Israel had to hear the message first. And here we have Jesus' public ministry. And he's already commended the faith of the Gentile centurion. Now he comments on the equally remarkable faith of this Canaanite woman, a non-Jew living some way north of Israel. He and his disciples have been there. They have stayed for some time, perhaps to escape the aggression from the controversial things that, that he had been saying. Now, there isn't one of you here who stands up for Jesus, doesn't know what it's like to be stabbed in the back, and realize that it's simply because you are a member of the faith and you're standing up for Jesus. And mind you, sometimes it's quite hard to be grateful for it and say, thank you, Lord, I must have been witnessing well. Help me to continue without faltering. And then, as Canon David Brown taught me, to bless them, because I would be putting them straight into Jesus' hands. Our woman in the story tonight addresses Jesus as the son of David. She's identifying him as the Messiah. It is the messianic title. And she understands, and she uses it to her advantage in this sort of banter with Jesus. Um, and she has come for her precious daughter, and she receives what she has asked for. We come from all sorts of backgrounds. We come in faith, sometimes because we have been knocked about or stabbed in the back. Our faith has wavered and we find it hard to say, whoopee, I must be getting it right. We're wobbly. And yet, that is exactly when we can be touched and renewed and sent out again. I think it's such a privilege to be able to gather like this, to encourage one another, and to stand in this historic site where there was such a revival in the 1800s, and to pray again, Lord, do it again. Begin with us. We really want to see the whole of our city coming back to Jesus and to take every opportunity we can to encourage that. But then we think, who am I? I'm only a little old woman. What can I do? My personal experience of little old women, excluding myself, is that they can be the most mighty prayer warriors. And I would want to encourage every one of you to do just that, to constantly pray. Pray as you walk about, pray as you're pushing the shopping trolley, pray as you're doing the washing or the garden. Pray for God's kingdom to come afresh in this place, in this land, that it once again would be known 
as the land of saints and scholars, not that troublesome place. I have to commend Adrian and Fergus taking their walk from St. Anne's to Saul. I think that's the sort of initiative that captures imagination, and I would like to encourage you all for that. But it's in our day-to-day -day encounters with people. Pushing a shopping trolley, the one time I think I had himself with me, because he doesn't do shopping. We had been together at a meeting and I wanted to get some shopping on the way home. And this little old lady, look who's talking, uh, stopped me and said, you a minister? And I said, yes. She said, would you pray for me? I've just been to the hospital and had the most awful news. And I looked round and suddenly <coughs> himself was at the end of the aisle, <laughs> standing uh, patiently waiting, but not interacting. And I prayed for him. And afterwards, Rab said, it was quite amazing the number of people who pushed their trolley past and then stopped for a moment or two. And he said it was almost as though they were joining in as well. So you've no idea how you are perceived as you do something like that and how you can encourage one another. I think Fergus and I have the most amazing job in the world. I think you would agree, Brother David, because it's the sort of thing that you have no idea what's going to happen every day. You might have things in your diary, but beyond that, the doorbell can go and there's somebody on the doorstep. And that's just so exciting. And even when you go about and somebody recognizes you, it's the ministry by walking about. It's not intentional, but yes it is, because your will is to capture everyone. I would just, all I can say is, I just want to encourage you. I think it is such a tremendous opportunity we all have. Now, it's not always easy to smile if you get out of bed the wrong side because you're aching or whatever. But even in those circumstances, and perhaps maybe especially in those circumstances, it is something worth giving to others. So let me pray. Father, thank you for every person here and every family they represent. And Lord, I pray that you would keep your hand on each person, that they would know your presence and your love and your care, and that they would be so encouraged regardless of their circumstance, that they can touch others and let them know all about you. Lord, we want this place set alive for you, that this land again would be the land where it is known that you dwell, the land of saints and scholars, the land of people who love you, the land who will not be divided, the land who look on the same horizon, and that horizon is you. So may your kingdom come and your will be done in this place and beyond.